Hi, well welcome everyone. My name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, and, and I'd like to welcome everyone to one of our uh, of our ongoing webinar series. This series uh, today is the is the I guess the inaugural series of our for our rehab folks. It's not a topic that's that's dedicated solely to rehab folks, but it is a a, a topic that our that CAFC's Canadian Network of Child and Rehab thought would be of interest. So they had had suggested that we bring our CIHR team in, in Parenting Matters to, uh, to a webinar and, and we've done that and in fact this is going to be part one of what is currently scheduled to be a two-part series, maybe uh, even a three-part series if, uh, if we can convince our presenters to do that. Um, so today's topic is uh, Parenting Children with neuro Neurodevelopmental Disorders. What do we know and what are the opportunities? And uh, this, this uh, webinar is being recorded and we will we do post all of our webinars on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network and uh, anyone attending this webinar will receive an email following this with some information about how to how to find that webinar and we encourage you to to pass that information along to all of your colleagues who may not have been able to see this or if you yourself are are unable to stay for the entire presentation or for, for, for whatever reason uh, there will be an opportunity to see the, rec the full recorded audio and video on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well as any of our other webinars are all posted there. I think that's all I have for the technical introduction, so uh, we'll move on to the presentation. So I'm just going to be handing it over to our presenters uh, in a few seconds, but I'd also just like to say how proud we are to bring this work to our to CAFC's audience, as CAFC was identified as a, a knowledge uh, a knowledge exchange partner in this in this work. Elaine Orbein sits on the <coughs> national advisory group for this research program. Elaine's CAFC's president, CEO. So we've been very committed to this work for quite a number of years, and we're really glad to see. Uh, what's come out of this and to, to be a part of uh, this opportunity to present this work to our audience. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to the to the team in, in Parenting Matters. And uh, the team that we have with us today is uh, uh, Dr. Peter Rosenbaum, who's a professor at Canchild, the Center for Disability Research, and he's at McMaster University in Hamilton. Uh, Lu uh, Lucy Locke at the School of Social Work in, at McGill University in the Division of General Pediatrics at Montreal Children's. Uh, Rubab Areem, who is a postdoctoral fellow at OHRI and a researcher uh, in the Health Analysis Division at Stats Canada. She's not able to be presenting with, with us today, but she is certainly a part of the team. And we also have with us today Daphne Cohen, who is a principal researcher in the, also in the Health Analysis Division at Stats Canada. So without further ado, Peter, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, we have a, uh, if we just go back a second, uh, whoever has uh, got the trigger finger. Uh, I just want to make a comment about all the logos on the bottom left. The work that we're doing uh, in the Parenting Matters project is part of a uh, new emerging team uh, effort <clears throat> co-funded co by CIHR and the Blue Review Research Institute, which made money available to CIHR a few years ago, and we were one of three uh, programs of research. And Lucy has a long list of, of the uh, uh, actors in this project, which we will present at the end. Uh, Lucy's at McGill. I'm at uh, Canchild, the flying logo. Um, Daphna is at Statistics Canada, and uh, Rubab is at the Ontario, or sort of the Ottawa Health Research Institute. And um, the work that we're doing really involves a lot of people in a lot of places. Uh, and we uh, struggled, I would say, to figure out how to focus what we wanted to talk about today. And as Doug has said, we, we've threatened uh, to offer a second uh, webinar about some of the continuing work that we will allude to just in passing today. Um, so now we can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so we thought that, first of all, um, we hope that by the end of this session, uh, people will begin to uh, answer, be able to answer the question why it's important to study parenting of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, and we will elaborate on what we mean by NDD as we go. And to reflect on the question about the extent to which parenting behaviors by caregivers of children uh, differ whether they differ and the extent to which they differ from the behaviors of caregivers whose children do not have NDD. Uh, and I think there's a second learning objective um, to try to understand what are the factors within the child, 
the parent and the family that might inform and influence parenting behaviors among caregivers of children with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and as we'll explain uh, throughout this talk, um, we got to this set of issues from some work we had been doing um, over several years, and we'll explain that as we go along. We have some questions that we'd like to raise uh, with you, and we have what we call uh, answering questions, which are in green, and thinking questions or rhetorical questions, uh, which we hope will you will be provoked to think about. So the first, the first answering question is whether you, as a clinician or a service provider, uh, anybody who has a direct face-to-face -face encounter with families, do you routinely include questions about parenting? about parenting behaviors, parenting experiences, or parenting interactions in your assessment. So we'll just give people the chance to write in a yes-no answer. Uh, there, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen, uh, and this is just your opportunity to uh, you know, click, as you said, a yes or no answer. This is a, a multiple choice question, and if there's a group of you out there, um, uh, you only are able to put in one, one answer to the question, so you'll have to come to some consensus among yourselves. So. I can see lots of answers uh, coming in, so we're just about uh, to 80% of the audience has voted. So we'll leave it open. There's for no, another. there's no pressure to answer these questions in a particular way. These are these are really just kind of openers to to for us to find out to what extent the ideas that we're interested in are either old hat or are you know new territory for people. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got the majority of the audience has answered, um, and there's the uh, results. We've got it. Uh, exactly 80% said yes, they do routinely include these questions, and 20% said no. Okay. Now the pressure on the people who said yes is going to be later on to get into the discussion about how they do this and what they do and so on. So just <laughs> just to remind you, you're not you don't get away with just answering the question. The second question then is, are you personally comfortable asking parents about parenting issues? So we'll just launch that second poll and give everyone a chance to uh, put in their answers. And I guess just uh, I've got a couple of comments that came in through the question box. Uh, uh, someone has indicated that they're a parent. So these questions obviously are, are targeted at healthcare practitioners, but they're <laughs> just, you know, just, to allow you, just to recognize that there are a number of family representatives from our family advisory councils and others that are in the audience. But uh, obviously these questions do seem to be targeted at the healthcare professionals. So we'll just close this poll off, and we've got 85% uh, okay. have said yes, they're comfortable, Excellent. and 50% said no. Okay, good, thank you. Here. Yeah, the, 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 the bottom question, the bottom green question is, does your program, if you're a clinician or a program manager, does your program have resources that specifically are dedicated to supporting parents? And you'll see later on why we're asking these questions and how we want to open up the discussion. And for the Canadians on the call, there are no robocalls here. <laughs> <laughs> we do have an international audience, so that may not make sense to some yeah, well, folks. Well, the international audience, <laughs> we can explain that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here uh, we've got 68% uh, have said yes and 32% uh, have said no. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Now we'll just go back to the to the rhetorical question, um, and that and this leads into some things Lucy's going to talk about in a minute. Um, we think it's interesting to consider how people think about uh, advising parents and how. <coughs> What, what sorts of frameworks we used, and I'll turn this over to, to Lucy to elaborate. Right, so I'm uh, sitting here in my desk in my office at McGill uh, looking at a screen, and this is the first time I've done a webinar, so it's, uh, it's kind of a neat experience. I, um, this, what this slide is about is uh, the sources of knowledge that we draw upon, we, and by we I mean uh, probably more practitioners and perhaps parents as well, but um, academics and researchers, what are the sources of knowledge that we draw on to generate our representation of what constitutes good enough parenting? 
Um, and I would say there's, uh, there's uh, sources of knowledge that we draw on that have to do with images in the media. Uh, there's certainly an academic, there are academic sources of knowledge, which I'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes. And then there's the kind of repeated patterns or what we think we're observing repeatedly in practice and the wisdom that, that's acquired um, through the, those, those kinds of repeated experiences. So if we turn just to the media uh, and the kinds of images that we have of parenting of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, we have images of uh, certainly parents who are tireless advocates, uh, committed, uh, driven, uh, excellent, uh, ar articulate, um, you know, really making a huge difference uh, through coalitions, through uh, family advisory groups uh, to advocate for services for their child, to advocate against uh, stigma. Um, and we also have images of parents who are villains. Uh, parents uh, like Robert Latimer, for example, or others who have um, harmed uh, their child and in some uh, severe circumstances even killed their child. So these are, um, you know, the general public certainly has a broad range of stories as well as images to draw on to, con to generate their understanding or uh, their representation of what it's like to be a mother or a father uh, to a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. In the academic context, uh, if we kind of just take a, um, a, a run at, the, at the, what, what's being published, what's being written about, uh, there really is a kind of an equally broad spectrum of topics uh, that have to do with uh, what, you know, what, what, what's being studied when parrots are being studied. Um, on the one hand, we've got a um, lot of theoretical, some empirical writings about parents who are extremely resilient um, and, and the, the very positive ways in which they're managing uh, the demands and, the, and as well as the joys of, of, uh, of, of raising a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. And then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, in the social science literature, we have uh, studies and articles, publications that document the extent of distress uh, in par among parents, as well as the, the difficulties and the challenges that they face in, in raising their, their child. And, you know, many, many, many studies documenting uh, rates of depression, rates of anxiety, rates of, of, uh, of um, you know, stress in, um, in, in the parenting relationship. Um, in the, in the, what we can't ignore at the same time is some literature that is worth noting. It's not, um, in, well, perhaps it's well known, uh, and that has to do with the, uh, the over-representation of children with neurodevelopmental disorders and disabilities, more broadly speaking, that come into contact with child welfare. Um, so with children's aid societies who are either turning to child welfare for support in raising their child or are finding it difficult to manage uh, the kinds of uh, issues that, uh, that parents have in raising their, their child. And then finally, we have, you know, the conversations that occur around the nursing station or around, uh, you know, in the, in the office about what we think of, what we all think parents should be doing. Um, and everybody's got an opinion about, I think most of us have an opinion about what, what constitutes good, uh, good enough parenting, good parenting, what, how parents should be interacting with their child. And this really is a, is a function of, you know, accumulated wisdom, received wisdom is what I call it, um, that, uh, that, that in practitioners acquire over the course of time. Okay, I'm going to turn over to Peter now, who's going to give us a bit of a history, or give you a bit of a history on, um, on where our interest in parenting emerged from. Thank you. Um, the work that we did in, uh, at 
the uh, 99, 2000, 2001, uh, was published in a series of papers and what we refer to as the caregiver study. And the caregiver study came about kind of as an afterthought. Um, we had done a lot of work, uh, and those of you who work with uh, children with cerebral palsy will know that we'd looked at motor development in children with cerebral palsy and really had ignored the parents and the parents' issues, uh, except to the extent that parents consented to be in the study. And we had a very large population, 650 families whose children had cerebral palsy. And because of our interest in the mid-90s, our emerging interest in families and family well-being, we recognized and shamelessly took advantage of an opportunity to ask parents about their health and well-being. And the original caregiver study um, that uh, uh, is published in, in, with, by, in papers by Brio and by Rena um, involved us going to parents, largely mothers as it turned out, of 468 of the, of the families whose children had been in the motor development study and asked them about their physical and mental health. And the questions that we used were all, the questions and questionnaires quite frankly, were all from Canadian population health studies. And we've done that for two obvious reasons. One is that these questions and questionnaires had been developed and, and tested and were, were reliable and useful. Uh, and by doing this, we then had the opportunity to contrast what the parents of children with cerebral palsy were telling us with what other comparable parents and, and adults in Canada had told us. And I'll show you some data in a minute. Um, one of the things that we learned in, in this study and in other work uh, was that uh, there was an, a major concern with children's behavior, and you won't be surprised about that. Um, but the second set of studies, the caregivers of children with a broad range of health problems, and again we will elaborate in a minute on what we mean by this, uh, were studies that were led by Daphne Cohen and her husband Jamie Brio um, to now look at the kinds of questions we had looked at in parents of children with cerebral palsy using the broad range of health issues from the National Longitudinal Study of Children and Youth. And in effect, to ask similar questions of a different kind of database, much broader in terms of scope and so on, and to see what we would, what, whether what we had found in the initial study uh, held up. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. The caregivers of children with neurodevelopmental disabilities, uh, we were asking, uh, first of all, what's the impact of having a child with a complex health condition, a neurodevelopmental disability, with or without a behavior problem? Um, and in the national, sorry, I guess I should say that what we found in the original study, and what, what I refer to as the caregiver study, is we found consistent and important differences between the physical health of parent of caregivers and the physical health of comparable Canadians and the mental health of caregivers compared with the mental health of comparable Canadians. And so however one looked at the health of the caregivers of, of parents of cere children with cerebral palsy age 6 to 16, the children, not the parents, um, we found uh, significant differences in health and well-being. The uh, subsequent study by Daphna and Jamie um, asked similar questions. and We asked about the physical and psychological health of the parents. We asked about uh, chronic conditions, activity limitations, and so on. And these are, these are self-report uh, responses, uh, just as are collected in the population health studies. And we asked about psychosocial adjustments, such as marital satisfaction, social support, and family functioning. So there, were nothing, there was nothing we asked that was different in tone or in wording from what is collected in population studies. Next, please. Um, okay, well the question then is why did we suddenly switch from a specific diagnosis to what we're calling NDD or neurodevelopmental disability uh, in the face of the reality that 
clinical services are, or, are usually organized by diagnosis, so the CP clinic, the autism clinic, and so on. Uh, and of course, parents have experience largely with their own child with a particular diagnosis. And many of the questions and issues that they're concerned with, rightly, are about that diagnosis or that condition. But as it turns out, there is, a, as you'll see, an old idea that dates back at least to the mid-70s of the last century, for those of you who don't think in centuries as some of us do, uh, to what's called the non-categorical approach, which recognizes that across diagnostic groups, things that may be biomedically distinct, in fact, there's a lot of common issues. And the, uh, the flip side of that is there is a huge amount of variability in function and, and capability within a particular diagnosis. So if we line up a thousand children with cerebral palsy or autism or mental retardation or, or, or Down syndrome, uh, we will see an enormous amount of variation within those groups. And we also recognize that parenting is importantly informed and influenced by a child's level of function and the, the complexity of their, of their biomedical and, and developmental issues rather than by the diagnosis. So one can't simply say, well, children with such and such a condition are, should be parented in a certain way. And so we have very strongly uh, endorsed and, and taken advantage of this non-categorical thinking, which, as I say, was first postulated to our awareness by Barry Pless and Philip Pinkerton in 1975 in a, in a book and uh, Ruth Stein and, and uh, uh, I can't remember Jessup's first name, uh, put forward some data to support this idea, and there's a lot more data since then. So next, please. So what do we mean by NDDs? NDDs are any impairments of the brain or central nervous system associated with any or all of motor issues, cognitive issues, behavioral issues, or language function. In other words, these are conditions that affect a child's performance and output of day-to-day -day activities in a way that is uh, different from typical development. Uh, they can affect different aspects of function, uh, ambulation, self-care, and so on. Um, and I presume that everybody who's interested in this topic and is here today knows this very well. The challenge of figuring out how many people have it is difficult because of differences in definition and differences in ways of finding people. But we're probably talking about 8 to 9 percent of children under the age of 18 uh, showing some kind of a neurodevelopmental disability. Not all of them, by any means, are severely compromised in day-to-day -day activity, but there's a lot of it out there. And uh, we think that from a pu public health point of view, this is a topic that's worth uh, thinking about uh, very seriously. And Lucy will now explain kind of how we, how we went about looking at this. Right, so we were using this um, very, very large database called the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth in Canada, which is a survey that has had been running uh, until last year, um, every two years since 1994. And this is a survey that collects data on the health of Canada's children. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, there's information in that database about uh, parenting. And there's also information in that database of thousands of children um, where parents are asked to identify whether their child has a, a, a chronic condition and they provide, there's a list of chronic conditions that are, that are indicated there. Um, so, so the question is how did we find kids with neurodevelopmental disorders in this monstrous database? Well, um, we used two, uh, we, did it, we went about that in two ways. We used this checklist, and in that checklist there were diagnoses such as epilepsy, cerebral palsy, mental handicap, and learning disability. So we plucked those kids out of the database saying, for sure, these are kids that we think have a neuro, are pretty likely because a parent has answered affirmatively that they have one of these uh, diagnoses or conditions. Um, and then there's also a measure in there called the Health Utilities Index. It's got a bunch of subscales, and we selected um, kids that were scoring in a, what we thought it was fairly safe to say in a range that indicated on these subscales that, that they had speech issues, 
mobility issues, dexterity, or, um, and cog or sorry, cognition issues. Now, what, uh, what we thought was going to be important uh, and different from our previous work was that uh, kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, all of you know, whom have some kind of central nervous system involvement, some also have behavior problems, and that those children with behavior problems, um, they present an increased complexity in terms of their care and their parenting. So we also then wanted to identify kids in the database who would have a behavior problem only, um, and we were able to, again, pluck those children out of the database because the person most knowledgeable, who was the person that was responding to the survey, uh, reported on their child's behavior uh, used in, in, that, in that survey. There were a number of, uh, of scales. One is on hyperactivity and inattention. Another one is on uh, conduct disorder or physical aggression. And a uh, third one on indirect aggression. So for all intents and purposes, we were able to look at four key groups and have continued to do so over time. So this is, this is really important for you in terms of understanding where our research has gone because we have this group that we're looking at who only have a neurodevelopmental disorder. We have this other group that we're looking at that have only this sort of externalizing type behavior problems. And then we have a group that has both neurodevelopmental and behavior problems. And then there's a fourth group that has none of those conditions. So in this next slide, you'll be able to see um, what numbers, what kind of numbers we're looking at. Um, so if we look just to the uh, neurodevelopmental only group, um, there were 815 children that we located between the ages of 4 and 11 in that, uh, in that 1994 wave which represented 6% of our sample. Um, then we turn to the bottom left where kids have behavior problems only, and that's 9% of our sample, 1,322 kids. Kids who have both are 3%, uh, 452 children would have had both a neurodevelopmental disorder and a behavior problem. And then these, the, this very large group which have neither of these uh, conditions. And just to give you a, a sort of a sampling of, you know, who are the children, what kinds of conditions do they have, in the neurodevelopmental group we have 2% uh, with cerebral palsy, 3% with epilepsy, 31% with learning disability, 70% uh, that we're scoring on this uh, health utilities index is indicating pretty, um, pretty substantial uh, issues related to cognition, uh, mobility and speech, and then if you turn to the other side of this table, to the right-hand side, you see what's represented, the kind of diagnosis that are represented in the, and functional limitations, pardon me, that are represented in the both group, as well as the kind of behavioral issues, hyperactivity and attention, and then we have the behavior problem group in the middle. Just before we move on, I, I just want to comment to the <clears throat> uh, clinicians in the audience that um, one of the huge values of a large population sample is obviously numbers, but one can think about population health data as being uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, and so one does not have in this kind of a database uh, the kind of clinical detail that we will collect when we, and we will be interested in when we meet with a family about a particular child. And so there's a trade-off here uh, between a, the degree of precision and, and detail and the scope. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay, Peter, this is yours. Okay, if we look then at the caregiver study uh, data, <clears throat> and you'll see the groups uh, that uh, Lucy's just described, uh, among the parents who self-reported excellent or good general health, you see that when, the, when their children had neither a behavioral problem or a neurodevelopmental disability, 75% uh, are reporting that their health, they see their health as being good or excellent. Uh, whereas when a parent is parenting a child who has both behavioral and, and developmental issues, uh, that's a substantially diff, uh, different uh, proportion who report their own health as good. 
Now, whether this is how they perceive themselves or whether this is actually uh, their state of health, we don't know. And in a sense, it doesn't matter uh, for the purposes of this kind of a conversation. When we turn to their self-reported presence of chronic conditions, again, you see that 40%, just over 40% of parents raising typically developing kids say they have a chronic condition, uh, whereas 60% of parents who uh, are coping with a child with behavioral and developmental issues uh, report that they have a chronic condition. Uh, next, please. When we look at their physical health and uh, with respect to a so-called activity limitation, once again, a very clear uh, picture of uh, activity limitation differences from something like 8% to something like 22%. Uh, depending on the nature of the parenting challenges and, and issues that families are, are facing. And I think there's one more. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and again, self-reported depressive symptoms. Uh, not a huge proportion. Uh, if you look at the right side, you see these are percentages. Uh, I think, are they percentages or scores? Scores. Scores. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, then there is, you know, a substantial difference uh, between the score on depressive, self-reported depressive symptoms between parents parenting typical children and parents uh, who are facing uh, the challenges of a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder, a behavioral problem, or both. And so, oh, you know, this this whole uh, story I think shows us that there are reasons to be concerned about parent well-being. Now, we haven't yet talked about parenting, uh, and we will get to that. Um, but uh, actually, I think, Lucy, you're going to pick up from this point, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So this is a bit of a busy slide, so I'm going to try and focus your eye. Um, first one, first uh, color that I want you to pay attention to is the green, OK? So these are, um, the green is a, is a score on a scale of uh, family function, just saying, you know, is the family doing better or worse? And um, higher scores, so as you go up, uh, mean that the family is more distressed. So, you're, you know, you begin to see a fairly similar pattern in that the both group uh, is is the one that is scoring, is the most distressed, this, um, and the neither group is the least uh, distressed. Um, and then again, the neurodevelopmental group um, and the behavior problem group, we sort of see a, an, incre you know, an, in, an increase in distress as you go from neither to neurodevelopmental to behavior problem to the both group. Um, now, just if you can, please pay attention to the red bar. This is a, um, a question that was asked around marital satisfaction, so the extent to which people are, are satisfied. And this was asked, um, we only used those who were married to, to, uh, to answer this question. Um, and what you'll notice is that there's not a huge difference among the groups. And in fact, there was no statistically significant difference. Uh, regardless of whether you had a child with both a neurodevelopmental disorder, just a behavior problem, neurodevelopmental only, or neither. It was a very stable uh, score. And then finally, um, the last group is um, the parents were asked about the extent to which they had access to social support. Um, and there was a series of questions evaluating that. And we have um, the, the neither group that had, felt that they had the most access and the both group that had less access. Now, it's not a huge, it doesn't look like a huge difference on this uh, particular bar graph. But in fact, the difference between the neither group and the both group is uh, statistically significant in that those who have a child with both conditions feel that they have the least, that they don't have as, as, good, as good access as those who with, uh, with neither condition. Okay, I want to just go back to the, um, if you, on this slide, just back to the green bar on family distress, because it is telling us a story, right? So in this, all of these, these bar graphs so far are telling us a story that 
parents who have children with both, uh, neuro both neurodevelopmental disorder and externalizing behavior problems, have kids with both of those conditions, that they're the ones that are the most compromised uh, physically, uh, they're the ones that are most psychologically distressed, and they're also the ones that are in families where, uh, where the family is, is uh, struggling. Um, and, but let's look at, you know, what proportion of the sample is scoring in what we call the clinical range, or another way of thinking about this is what percentage of the sample is scoring in the clinically distressed range. And what we see are, is, is really quite important. Um, the both group, about 17% are in the clinical range. The behavior problem group looks like about 13%. The neurodevelopmental disorder group just under 12, and the neither just under 7%. So these are all um, uh, important differences. Obviously, the biggest difference is between the both and the neither group. But these, all of these differences, uh, the neurodevelopmental disorder group differs from the neither group, and the behavior problem group differs from the neither group as well. Okay, Peter, the next slide's for you. Right, so here's a yes-no question. Parents of children with a neurodevelopmental uh, condition did not parent their children in the same way as do parents of children who do not have a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, your thoughts, yes, no. Okay, so about two-thirds think that parents don't parent the same way. Thank you. Our next yes, no question. Parents of children with a neurodevelopmental disorder find it harder to parent than parents whose child does not have a neurodevelopmental disorder. And uh, flip the results around here. So 98% uh, said yes. Yeah, two percent. Okay, good, thank you. This is very helpful. Um, and so one of the questions that we're exploring, and this is, you don't have to answer this at this point, is what are some of the characteristics that make a difference in how parents parent and what type of caregiver attributes make a difference? Um, so we're obviously interested, as we indicated at the beginning, in factors in the child, factors in the family, factors in the circumstance that might influence this, because obviously people are recognizing that there are important things. Uh, so let's go on to sort of help you understand why we got into the business of thinking about parenting as distinct from thinking about parent health. Next, please. Peter, when do you want to answer the questions from oh, one of All right. Well, maybe we should let's answer the question now. Uh, questions because they're probably they're obviously related to what we talked about. Yeah, there's, a, there's some fairly simple questions. I don't think these will be too hard uh, to answer. We just had a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, Susan has indicated that she runs a support group for parents of children with FASD, and she's also suggesting that since FASD is the highest incidence of NDD. Uh, she thought it would be a good one to study. So I, CAF sees, uh, FASD is close to CAF sees hard. We've got a large program in screening for FASD, so I, I think uh, more study in that area certainly would be warranted. I don't know if you guys have any comment on that in particular. No, I think you've answered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the other thing, for some of the results that we're presenting today, we're limited by what was asked in the National Longitudinal Survey. So often there isn't, you know, enough. Um, respondents who specifically uh, answered in one category. But, but so, you although, know, it, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was going to say the, the, co the comment by Susan about uh, the, the prevalence of FASD being the most prevalent, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I don't know that uh, how the prevalence of FASD compares to the prevalence of epilepsy or learning disabilities or uh, cerebral palsy or autism spectrum disorder, um, but what we often hear um, from parent groups um, about this is, uh, is exactly that comment that, and uh, that pitch that, uh, you know, it is the most prevalent and I think you know, parents feel very passionate about um, their particular child's uh, diagnosis. Um, the, the, um, so we're not able to comment, unfortunately, in this study on specific diagnoses uh, because we've taken this kind of non-categorical approach. Um, but, and, and it's a perfect example of how even within FASD, 
there's a range of the kind of impairments that kids present with um, in, in, as there is in autism, as there is in, uh, in global developmental delay. Next. Okay. All right. The, uh, the next question was, uh, and, and this one, uh, this, this, these types of questions often get raised in, with respect to specific services that might be offered in a, in a specific province and, and due to differences uh, in the various jurisdictions, it's often hard for presenters to answer these types of questions, but I'll, I'll read it anyways to see if you have any comment. Um, this person's saying, in my experience as a CAS social worker in the special unit, families were coming to the children's aid because their health was failing and they were looking for future planning and respite. Uh, their, her question is, what opportunities in practice and policy are there to support families to plan for the future? Whoa, that's a huge question. We can, what we'll be able to do is, I'm going to leave, I'm going to suggest that we leave this till the end when Lucy describes the overall parenting matters um, jigsaw that we're working with and some information that is uh, available now broadly on this topic. Uh, I think it is at least partly a rhetorical question and an extremely important one uh, and one that has motivated us to, to think about these issues in many ways, clinical, as we've been talking about, population health, but also policy issues. Excellent question, though. And uh, the next question uh, was uh, came up uh, referring to Lucy's very colorful slide with the, uh, the bar graphs about uh, family distress and marital satisfaction, et cetera. Um, this person is asking regarding the marital satisfaction, and, I, and I don't, your, your graph indicated that there was no difference between groups, but she's asking, does this mean that all parents were satisfied or, un, or were they unsatisfied? I'm not sure if, if your information told you their specific level of satisfaction or just the differences in the groups. The scale um, of uh, marital satisfaction went from 0 to 11. And so you can see that there is a bit, and where 11 meant highly satisfied and 0 would be obviously highly unsatisfied. Um, and they were pretty satisfied because they're scoring just around, you know, the nine, 9 out of 11. All right. And that's all the questions that we have uh, for now, but uh, again, just a reminder to the audience to uh, continue to, to type them in as you think of them. So back over to you, Lucy. Okay, we'll, we'll move along, I think, fairly, a little more quickly. So we, we just thought it was worth uh, thinking, you don't have to answer these uh, except in your own minds, why study parenting? We, obviously, we think there are clinical questions and what are our traditional assumptions about parenting children with NDDs? This relates to Lucy's uh, uh, comment earlier on about the ways in which the media and clinicians and researchers think about this. Um, so do we say, as I have done for years, well, you should do with him or her what you did with your other kids. That's one approach, a normative approach. We can think about, we like to think about parent as sculptor uh, or uh, that is parent in control, and if your kid turns out well, that's because you're doing a good job, uh, versus the idea that many of us like now is parenting is a, um, is a dance led by the children. And this then changes the dynamic and the way we think about the dynamic of parenting. So the parents who or children who are different kinds of dancers may bring their parents along in a different way. Uh, this leads us to wonder whether parenting differs, and if so, in what ways, and what are the reasons for this. And we clearly want to know what helps parents to be uh, better parents, better in the sense of more effective parents, in the context of raising children whose, whose lives are challenged and whose lives are challenging. Uh, there are also, in the next slide, a, a, a raft of research questions. Uh, one of which is, does parenting make a difference to the child? And if so, in what ways and by what pathways? Because we clearly need to know whether this is important. If it isn't, then let's move on to something else. If it is, then we need to know in what ways it's important and understand how best to, uh, to support this. And then uh, the other uh, sort of broad issue for us is that if there are important variations in parenting, there might be policy implications, and those policy implications can happen at the program level. How do we staff our program? What resources do we have in our particular program? How do we use the funding we have? Do we need, of course, the answer is yes, we need more funding, but how would we use new funding? And at a policy-making level, 
Um, how do, do we see family as the unit of interest or do we see the child as the unit of interest? And that has enormous implications for uh, what we do as a community, as a society. And again, Lucy will allude to some work we've done on this uh, later on. But I'm going to turn it over now to Daphna. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, so we had two broad um, research questions. And this, again, is referring to our studies with the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth. And the first one is, do parents of children with or without neurodevelopmental problems and or behavior problems differ in their parenting behaviors. And next slide, please. And the second question asks about, in the context of childhood disabilities, what factors of the child, the parent, and the family, as well as the social environment, have an influence on how parents are parenting their children? Um, next slide. So, um, these are the measures of parenting that we looked at from the National Longitudinal Survey. And um, you know, these just represent certain dimensions of parenting. And they're also based on what the parent is reporting of their own behavior. And of course, we know that these don't capture all the interesting aspects of parenting. But there are some interesting dimensions that we were able to look at. And we looked at um, three subscales, and these are based on the parenting practices scale developed by Strayhorn and Weidman. And the three subscales were positive interaction, consistent behaviors, and ineffective parenting behaviors. And um, so higher scores indicated more of that behavior, so either more positive, more consistent, or more ineffective. And the labels that are used for these scales are um, you know, descriptive of the items, but somewhat arbitrary. OK, uh, next slide, please. And the other thing I should mention is that the parents reported on their behaviors for each specific child that was surveyed. So even though there may be um, siblings that were uh, surveyed in, in the first few cycles, the parent would report on their parenting behavior with that specific child. So just to give you an idea of, of the types of measures that we had, the positive interaction scale would ask about how often do you and your child talk or play together, um, share focused attention on each other uh, for five minutes or more, or interact just for fun. The measure of consistency was more about whether or not uh, parents follow through with commands that they give to their children. Um, what proportion of the time do you make sure that your child um, follows through with a command that you've given? And ineffective parenting um, assessed things like how often do you get angry uh, when you punish your child? Um, how often do you get annoyed with your child for saying or doing something that they're not supposed to do? Um, things like that. So um, the first set of results are going to show um, I'm going to address the question of do parents of children with and without neurodevelopmental and or behavior problems differ in how they parent? And I think the responses um, from the poll suggest that um, your experience have shown that you probably know some of this. And um, so what, we've, what we have here is a figure for each of the um, parenting subscales. And um, what we see here in, in the first slide is we have um, the positive interactions as reported by parents of children in each of these four groups. And what we could see here is that um, uh, parents of children in the neither group reported the most positive interactions. And then each subsequent group reports um, a lower mean score of positive interactions with the both group having the least um, positive interactions. Next slide, please. Okay, and what we see um, with consistent parenting behaviors is that there's no difference between, there's no statistically significant difference in the consistent parenting behaviors reported by caregivers who had neither condition or caregivers of children in the uh, NDD group. However, um, 
caregivers of children with behavior problems or with both behavior problems and neurodevelopmental um, conditions reported uh, less consistent parenting behaviors than um, the first two groups. Next slide, please. Okay, and this final slide is ineffective parenting. Um, and again, just a reminder that this is based on uh, the parent's report, uh, so or the parent's perception of their own ineffective parenting behaviors. And what we see here is a significant um, increase with parents of children with a neurodevelopmental disorder reporting um, more ineffective uh, parenting behaviors than parents of children who had neither condition, and parents of children uh, with both conditions reporting the most ineffective parenting behaviors. Okay, then now it's my turn. Back to me. This is uh, the second question that we're answering in our presentation today. What we're, what we're interested in is, in addition to the diagnosis, are there other child uh, uh, characteristics of the child? Are there other characteristics of the parent or the family or the social environment that inform how a parent uh, parents their child? Uh, so we've seen, so, and, and, and does the diagnosis, or does the, not the diagnosis, but the, you know, the fact that the child has a neurodevelopmental disorder, when you, when, you, when you put all those factors into the hopper together with the, with the neurodevelopmental disorder and the behavior problem, does it still matter? Does, does having a, a neurodevelopmental disorder or a behavior problem or both, does it still matter as much? Um, and so here um, we're asking the, that, that question in relation to um, how parents experiencing their uh, parenting interactions in a positive way. Uh, so what is it about the child, parent, and social context that informs the extent to which parents experience their parenting interactions positively? Well, uh, those whose child is younger, those who have a child with a behavior problem, those who have um, uh, themselves a college or university degree, um, uh, who have lower levels of family distress, and uh, access, report um, experiencing access to social support, are more likely to experience their parenting interactions uh, positively. Having a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder, or both a neurodevelopmental disorder and behavior problem, did not inform the extent to which parents experience positive interactions with their child. So those factors did not matter. Okay? It did matter if you had a child with a behavior problem. Um, but if you had NDD or both NDD, it didn't really matter. It didn't make a difference. Then we asked, uh, what is it about the child, parent, and social context that informed the extent to which parents believed they were consistent in their parenting behavior? Well, those who had a younger child, uh, certainly having a, a younger child, you can be more consistent in your parenting. Having more than one child, not being the biological parent, having some post-secondary or college or university education, having a higher income. Um, those parents who had lower levels of depressive symptoms were able to be more consistent. Uh, those who had lower levels of family distress and those who reported receiving help from spiritual leaders uh, in their communities um, were more likely to report higher levels of consistency in their parenting behavior. Oh dear, not good. Um, <laughs> Having a child with both a neurodevelopmental disorder and behavior problem or a child who has just a behavior problem and is later born also informed the extent to which parents believed that they were consistent in their parenting. Sorry, I've got, I'm getting a webinar right now. Bye. <laughs> so sorry about that. I don't know how to put that on silent. And finally, who were, um, what other characteristics, what child, parent, and social environment uh, characteristics informed the extent to which ex parents experienced themselves as ineffective? Having a younger child, um, parenting a boy, having more than one child, parenting an earlier born child, being a male parent or the uh, biological parent, 
having some post-secondary or college university um, education, lower levels of depressive symptoms, higher levels of family distress, meant that you were more likely to report higher levels of ineffective parenting, um, having access to social support or availability of social support negatively affected, receiving support from books or magazines, and finally having a uh, child with neurodevelopmental disorder or both or a behavior problem it certainly did in the presence of all of those other factors inform the extent to which parents experience themselves as ineffective. And those who had a child with a behavior problem who was an only child or later born or male and those who had a child with neurodevelopmental disorders who were not receiving help from community or social service professionals were more likely to report higher levels of uh, parenting behavior that was ineffective. And this last point is really important actually um, because what we see here in this graph, um, this has to do with receiving social support from community or social um, or professionals. Um, and the, the top, the group that's yellow, is the both group. So regardless of whether they're receiving support from community um, or, or, or professionals, um, they have high levels, they report the highest levels of ineffective parenting. The same with the behavior problem group. It didn't seem, they didn't, they reported it really not making that much of a difference. Similar to the neither group, the whoops, they were the, they were the um, lowest, they had the lowest level of ineffective uh, parenting. And it didn't seem to matter whether they were receiving social support from the community or not. But the neurodevelopmental disorder group, notice what happens here. If they are receiving support, from the community or from professionals, their level of ineffective parenting that they report is the same as the neither group. So we're quite excited about that finding uh, because I think it says a lot about um, the need for and perhaps these, uh, the extent to which this group finds it helpful. Okay. So, Peter, this is off to you for conclusions. <laughs> um, just, I just want to make two quick comments uh, that I think will be uh, evident to the audience. One is that these are cross-sectional data. These are the association between this and that. These are not causal connections. Um, and it's very important that people understand that. If you're parenting and you're challenged by your child's issues, you may feel ineffective. Um, if you are an ineffective parent, uh, whatever that means, uh, you may not do a very good job. We're not making any judgment about either children or parents. We're simply saying these are associations which are worth thinking about. And the stage of this work and the stage of work like this is that at a fairly early um, phase of, of the development of a new set of, of issues, we really have to understand to the best that, that we can what's going on have some hypotheses about what might be going on um, and uh, then pursue them. The other thing to say is that there is no implication from us and no intention at all to assume that parents do a lousy job um, or that uh, they are ineffective. What we are reporting, and I want to underscore what Lucy said and what Daphne said, is we're reporting what parents have said about themselves. And so uh, if there are any parents on the line, and if there, as there are, and if there are any clinicians who think that we're being nasty, uh, uh, we hope that that's not the impression that we're giving or that you're left with. Uh, these are observations about how this and that seem to exist together. And as you'll see from the last few slides that Lucy's shown, this is complicated stuff. Uh, I don't mean that we're smart because we're doing it. I mean that it is a, a difficult area to study because there are so many things going on at the same time. So the conclusions that we've reached at this point is that raising and parenting a child with a health problem can be challenging with respect to the, phys the physical and mental health of the parents with respect to family function in the sense that there's more going on that uh, demands time and energy from parents that parents of children with both risk factors, a neurodevelopmental disability in their child and a behavioral issue, may experience the most challenging parenting situations, and that's a kind of duh 
a statement, but it's important to underscore it. And that in addition to child and parent characteristics, such as the children's age, their gender, birth order, and parent education, and so on, parent mood, family climate, the extent to which parents experience, uh, to which the parent experiences their social supports, also are, are important. So there's a lot going on. And uh, we are simply trying to map out the territory at this point to understand what's actually there. Next, please. Um, okay. I just wanted to make one comment about this last point here that has to do with parent mood and family climate and um, extent to which the parent experiences their social supports is available. For, for the viewpoint of intervention, what this suggests is that this is where we need to be targeting our efforts if we actually want to alter or improve or support parents in their parenting. Yeah. So I think we say some of that in the next slide with other implications. Um, so parenting, we, anybody who's a parent knows that it's probably the most difficult job we ever, ever undertake. And I'm talking about parenting typical kids. But it's even tougher for parents whose children have uh, more complicated lives. Next, please. Um, so we talked about the importance of evaluating parent mental health, family function, and the extent to which parents, the parent experiences their social support network, uh, because these are almost certainly things, A, over which we as professionals have some control in the, in the sense of being helpful with resources and, and sensitivity and so on, uh, and B, uh, with respect to how we think about what we do. Next, please. So we obviously, as Lucy said a minute ago, targeting these areas for intervention is essential. And given that we're into relatively new areas, even the FASD folks, uh, I would hope that Susan and the people that she's working with uh, are studying what they're doing. I think there is an opportunity and a responsibility, quite frankly, for us to be doing that. So the questions that we want to open up for discussion now, and I guess it will be typing in your questions to us is, or your answers to us is, do we see these issues within, within our mandate, whoever we are? Uh, we already know that people have said they're comfortable to identify these issues. Um, are we comfortable to help manage them? Because we can identify them but not necessarily manage them ourselves. And then um, the, the final sort of rhetorical question uh, concerns uh, whether our programs are resourced to address these issues. Um, and it's often not the case. We see future research questions about uh, allowing us and encouraging us to explore whether parenting makes a difference to child well-being. That's again a kind of dumb question in one respect, but the question that could be taken apart is if, if the answer is yes, what kinds of differences and of course the difference is can be that we make things worse and we need to be aware of that and how are these uh, to be assessed how are these differences to be assessed what are we looking at what should we be measuring um, if we know that there are differences we want to understand the mechanisms we want to know how this comes about uh, and if we gain think back to the idea of parent as sculptor it's easy to blame the parents I mean that's the classic story in autism uh, if we think about parenting as a dance led by the children, we can think about ways of helping parents to be more comfortable dancers. We can think about ways of helping children to dance more effectively. Uh, so understanding the mechanisms is very important. And then what are the things that we as professionals can do that may be helpful? And a question that is being explored is the question about separate rates of separation and divorce among these four groups. And uh, we're going to let that question hang uh, for now uh, because um, we don't want to talk about them today. And yeah, well, if, if we get invited back, we can actually begin. We, these are the kinds of questions that we can um, answer because we're just in the process of completing analysis and papers addressing these very questions. Yeah, and I realize that I actually took Daphne's question, uh, Daphne's <laughs> slide. So That's okay. You want to add to what I've said? No, that's good. Okay. Thank you. So we'll, we'll wrap up with Lucy kind of telling you what, where we're at now. Right. So um, this, the, the information that we've presented to you is one of, uh, of four parts of a puzzle that we've put together um, to, to address parenting. 
Um, and that's the national survey data that we've just presented to you. And we hope to come back and present to you the answers to the questions that um, Peter's just posed on the previous slide. But we're also doing a systematic review of the literature, uh, following uh, very kind of uh, informed, if you will, guidelines. Um, we wanted to, rather than cherry pick the literature to try to locate what we think we'd like to say about parenting, we're using a method of systematically reviewing what the literature on parenting of children with neurodevelopmental disorders has said about parenting, whether it differs, what informs how parents parent, and then what difference parenting makes. So we're answering very similar kinds of questions in that systematic review. Um, in response to one of the questions uh, posed earlier by the audience, we are doing an, a, a review of policies for parents uh, across Canada. So we're looking at federal as well as provincial and territorial policies that pertain to the delivery of income support, uh, respite care, and case management. Um, we're uh, just in the process of drilling down to more programmatic level to be able to develop a compendium of uh, the kinds of policies that exist, the programs that exist. Um, at, and as we, when I say drill down, we're kind of starting to drill down to the regional level to see what's there. We're, the exciting part about this project is that we're going to be posting the information on uh, the CanChild website. And in fact, uh, it's, it's under construction, but I can, um, Doug, I'm not sure how to go about doing this because I haven't actually posted the website here, but I certainly would like to make it available so that practitioners are aware um, that what we're constructing is, like if you're from Alberta, you click on Alberta and you can get information on what's available in Alberta with regard to um, income support programs, respite care, and case management. Um, and similarly, if you're from PEI or from Saskatchewan, that's all going to be there. How um, I can certainly just tell you that the, what the website address is now, but I haven't got it up on a slide. And maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll post it after. Can we do that, Doug? Yeah, we can. Uh, everybody that, I, that, that, that attends this webinar, as well as the people that registered and were unable to, to attend, we'll, we will follow up with them by email, letting them know where to find this presentation on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. And that page, we, can, we will host the actual video, audio and video of this presentation, but we can also put any other resources, links to your papers, uh, links to your websites, any, any other information on that page that, that, that you would like us to put up there, we can do that. Right, so right now the, you can take a peek at the website, it's at um, http canchildsubsite.icreate3.esolutionsgroup.ca slash en. Um, but we'll, as, as you suggested, we'll post that uh, so that people can see what, what it uh, begins to look like. We, we're hopeful that this will be a, 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 a helpful to practitioners as well as to parents. Um, and then finally, the last study which we've just uh, now embarked upon is a, is a smaller uh, clinical study, smaller vis-a-vis -vis the NLSCY, but we're, we're um, recruiting uh, for uh, parents, mothers, and fathers to participate in a study where uh, if you're in Edmonton or in Calgary or in Toronto or Hamilton or here in Montreal, um, this is a clinical study that uh, where we have measures, more refined measures of parenting, uh, uh, access to uh, social support uh, and programs, um, as well as, you know, quality of life of the child, as well as participation. It's a really uh, interesting study. We've, we're we've just starting on the recruitment for it, and we'll be very excited to come back to you in about a year and a half or two years when we finish collecting the data and analyzed it to, to talk more about what, uh, what parents have told us in that study. There's a, a measurement component to that study. Uh, which is quite involved, but really important. And then there's also a component to that study where we're actually going to be talking to parents and interviewing them. Um, and we've got a number of doctoral students who are working together with us. Um, one is interested in hope 
among parents. Another is interested in interviewing fathers about their experience. So we're really, really excited about uh, that project moving forward. I uh, just want to introduce to you the uh, team that's behind the scenes, which is vast and wide. Uh, Peter and I and Daphna are the principal investigators in this project. Uh, we have uh, Rachel Birnbaum at uh, King's leading the policy component, Rochelle Garner at Stat Can leading the, um, the NLSCY analysis, David Nicholas at the University of Calgary leading the clinical study, and Michael Saney at the University of Toronto leading the systematic review. And then we have a bunch of others, Jamie Braho, uh, Delphine, Colin Vazina here at McGill, Michael McKenzie at Columbia, Ted McNeil, just retired from Sick Kids, Allison Nichols at McMaster, who have been providing really valuable input on, um, for each of these projects in, in different ways. We also have a, um, a national research advisory group that's comprised of parents and advocates. We have Frank Gavin and Sue Robbins and Joanne Ganton, who've been absolutely um, instrumental in helping us to formulate our um, the measures as a, to select the measures that we've used and to to help us to present the measures to parents and this, as well as a study to to parents in a way that makes sense to them. Lindsay Yao is a young adult uh, who is part of that group. We have Elaine Orvine from CAFC and Diane Kelsey who's here from uh, Montreal. And we have some policymakers from Alberta and from uh, Manitoba who are advising us on uh, the design of the studies as well as how uh, we are going to make this information available to the various stakeholders that we hope will be interested in our findings. And finally we have our a uh, wonderful cadre of uh, great students that are re being trained in research techniques and hopefully we're preparing the next generation of individuals who will be as passionate about this work as we are. Okay, that's Peter. What, that's what we've got to show you so far. <laughs> uh, we're, we're now quite happy to open this up for discussion and conversation, or conversation being uh, uh, in quotations because it's not easy to have a conversation with a hundred people but um, people want to raise questions make observations uh, we're, we're more than happy to do that I guess Doug can moderate this yeah so exactly Peter uh, as you said it's, it's it's the audience's chance to start asking some more questions um, so feel free to type those in we do have one question that was uh, in the hopper back uh, it relates uh, to uh, some slides that Lucy was presenting um, Lucy, was in reference to the slides where you were talking about what is it about the child, parent, and social context that in, informs, you know, the, the positive nature of their interactions or the consistency, et cetera. You indicated that having a child with a behavior problem affects the positive interactions. And uh, Rubina has uh, commented that, or she's asked, she says, but isn't the behavioral problem a reason, for example, not the effect of the ineffective parenting? You know what? I caught that as well, and I need to go back and check um, whether that is uh, uh, a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> or problematic. Um, but thank you for catching that, Rubina. Uh, if there are some other questions, I can take a moment and look back on, on the paper. It, it, the association was in the direction you'd expect, so having a child with a behavior problem was associated with um, Less, uh, less positive interaction and less consistent parenting behaviors reported by the parents. Right. Okay. Thank you, Daphna. But, no but this, but this um, again illustrates the association between this and that. Um, and one could say, well, no wonder the kids have behavior problems. Look at how badly the parents are doing. And one could equally say, no wonder the parents are struggling. And look how terrible the child is. And I'm not saying either of those. I'm simply saying that one has to, having made this observation about how these things coexist, one now needs to try to take that apart in a variety of ways, uh, both by exploring these questions with cross-sectional data and potentially uh, by doing some of the things we hope to do in the clinical study. And probably most importantly, if we can do it eventually, to look at these questions over time and look at the 
and look at how things develop. All right, thank you. Um, so, so just another reminder: we don't have any other questions uh, right in the hopper yet, but uh, you know, it, we'll give everyone a, a few more minute, a couple minutes to uh, to finish typing if they're in process. Um, any other? Um, oh, Rubina just said thank you for uh, for the answer. Um, so, any other comments from the, our panelists? Uh, just while we're waiting for some questions to get typed in. I would make the general comment that in some ways there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, or it's easy for people to say, well, don't we already know all of this? And no is in quotations because we know what we know uh, for however we know it. From our clinical experience, we can easily, um, you know, make generalizations. Um, we have to recognize that our clinical observations are biased in various ways in the sense that we see who we see and we remember the people whose lives are in some more dramatic than those who are leading ordinary lives, if you will. Um, and the advantage of taking this kind of multivariable look using population health data, uh, looking at the literature and so on, is it gives us a chance to, to explore some of the things that are out there and and relate what we find from real life experience to what we think might be going on. Um, the population health studies are not do not engage people because they have a child with an issue. The work we do as clinicians virtually always involves us working with people whose children have an issue. And so we're seeing a subset of the population. And I think it's really important to emphasize that these are, it's not that one is more important or more valid than another, but they are different perspectives. And to the extent that we can relate these different perspectives to one another, we may actually learn what's going on. All right, thank you. So uh, I can see why uh, it took a little while to get some questions, and we've got a couple of long ones. So uh, the first one's a little bit shorter, but then I, the, the following questions are a little long, so bear with me while I read some of these. Um, this one's from Heather, and she says, will the National Policy Review look at what provinces say they are offering as well as what parents feel they are actually getting in terms of delivery of income support, respite, case management, et cetera? Really excellent question. Um, the, we've struggled with that ourselves because we have there's a you know we have a sense that what provinces say is available and what uh, parents actually experience on the ground are two very different things. Um, we are at the moment just looking at what provinces and services um, are are there on paper. We are validating that uh, through some key informant interviews. So we'll be generating a representation of what provinces say is available. Um, in, our clinical in our clinical study, uh, which is separate from the policy study, what we're doing there is we'll be talking to parents. Um, there's a measure of, uh, sorry, let me just back up. There is a measure of the kinds of services um, that parents are receiving and how adequate parents feel those services are. And there's, there will also be an opportunity in the qualitative interviews for parents to express their experiences regarding the delivery and the receipt of services uh, and the adequacy of those services. Um, but doing something more systematically, uh, just focused on that, we're not doing in this study. I think that is an excellent question and one that we hope to, uh, to take on in the future uh, in some way. Because uh, documenting that divide, or what we, I, I mean, this is part of my own received wisdom, <laughs> uh, documenting part of that divide is, uh, I think, going to be very important. Thank you for that question. All right. Uh, the next one is, is actually more of a comment than a question. This one's from Tessa. She says, uh, thanks for the great presentation. She looks forward to more of your work in the future. Um, she wanted to share that their organization, which is Holland Blurview, has recently started offering the Triple P Parenting Program. Uh, they're uh, they are, uh, running their first group program for parents of children in their neuromotor program. And they look forward to uh, their organizations providing more of these types of supports and programs which might actually make a difference for children and their caregivers. So, 
So there's uh, some some content that's, right there. That's what we would expect from Holland Lurieu, and that's great. I would encourage Tessa to make sure that there's some effort at evaluating it, not because I'm skeptical about it, but because I think the more evidence we can have uh, about the usefulness of programs like that, and there are others as well, the, the more we can pound the table with the administrators, although you don't have to do that at Holland Lurieu, the more we can pound the table with the, with the policymakers and say, look, not only is this important, but it works. So again, I, I emphasize this in my comment about to, to I think Susan earlier. Uh, please let us all contribute to the growing knowledge of this by taking advantage of the chance to explore and evaluate uh, when we do a new initiative. I'm, I'm familiar with the Triple P Parenting, the Stepping Stones program. It's one that's been rolled out in uh, pro province-wide province in, in some of the provinces in Canada, and I think Daphna may even be involved in some of its evaluation as well. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear from Tessa whether that's, uh, what, what the age group is that, that it's being offered to. Um, just to keep in mind that our sample here or the, the data that we've presented here are children between are parents of children between the ages of four and eleven, um, and as what I've seen so far of the stepping stones at least program is that it's for 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 the, that younger cohort. Um, so I'd be interested in, in some comments about that uh, if if Tess is still around. Yeah, and I'd just like to um, continue along, along with what Peter said about the evaluation component. It's really important not only um, to think about how, you know, something like that could be evaluated, but also to try to get someone to keep track of how many people are actually being seen through the program and where they're coming from, that kind of um, data as well, because it's really informative in uh, how useful the program is and what kind of um, outcomes you could point to. Right. And I think uh, Tess is trying to uh, type in a response, just a, a, a comment, just to answer your question, Lucy. Um, I don't think we got the whole answer, but I'll, uh, if, she fi if she finishes typing, I'll, uh, I'll bring that answer back uh, for you. Great. The, the, next question, the next question is from Nina, and she's saying, considering the factors you have found to be associated with parenting, if you take a step back on these, do you think there are some further factors that underpin several of these? In other words, do you think it will be the factors you identified, for example, income, education, that are the factors we will need to target through interventions, or do you think you will discover further factors that confound these and that could thus be more appropriately targeted? <laughs> you know, we'll have a lot to answer for after this webinar. Um, I, I, the short answer is that, I mean, it would be fabulous to target people's income by giving people more money, but um, one of the things that this kind of a study helps us to do, uh, and again, I underscore what Lucy said earlier, is by looking at a lot of factors, we can find out, first of all, which factors seem to be important, and second of all, which factors are potentially modifiable and exposing, if, if, if things like Triple P Parenting and Stepping Stones make a difference, we can certainly offer those to, to families. Uh, we can't do nearly as much about income and education. Those tend to be factors, uh, those kinds of factors which we can't change uh, are things that help us to understand possibly what the mechanisms might be and possibly uh, who are the kinds of people that we might want to make sure we, uh, we target in our interventions. Uh, so some of these are kind of background, this is what's going on sort of uh, information, and some of them are things uh, that are much closer to the surface about which we can potentially do something. The really important question. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, Tessa does uh, have an answer for you, Lucy. Uh, she said the ASD program ran for children between two and eight years old. Uh, the group evaluated parenting scores and stress, anxiety, which showed improvement. Uh, future programs are being offered to fathers and to children over eight years old, and they're looking forward to their results. Fabulous. That's wonderful. Oh, great. great to hear. Just to, just um, to get back, I would like to just get back to Peter to follow up on what Peter said about income. There are, um, you know, through the policy project, we certainly are learning of programs uh, 
you know, either through the federal government or match savings programs for education for kids. Um, there are, uh, you know, the extent to which parents actually avail themselves of the kind of income support programs that might help to make uh, a difference to their income um, is, 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 is important to pay attention to. I know that it's a hard, you can't just can't just throw more money at these families, but they are affected. Um, they're, uh, you know, if it's a two-parent family, often one parent is not able to work because they have to, you know, be be on call to uh, go to the school to attend appointments. When the incomes of these families are affected, and there are ways of mitigating some of that through uh, the tax system, through um, you know other kinds of income support, provincial and federal support programs, as well as match savings programs that could uh, make a small difference, uh, but make a difference nonetheless. I think if a parent is worried about, you know, whether there's food on the table, enough uh, or enough money to pay the hydro bill, uh, that really is absolutely going to affect uh, parenting. And the, the other point that I wanted to make is that in the clinical study, we are looking at additional uh, factors that are not in the NLSCY. I mean, that was the beauty of being able to, de to design something Pro, uh, prospectively in, in that we, we had uh, a, a lot of thought went into the kinds of measures that we're using. So for example, we're looking at uh, for, uh, parents' uh, experience of hope and how hopeful they are about their child and the difference that that makes to how they parent their child and the difference that that makes to their child. So we're, we're in exploring some really, uh, I think, novel um, relationships that may lead us to uh, more uh, informed interventions in the future. Right. Uh, the next question is from uh, Bonnie. Um, she says the the uh, impact on employment status of parents, in particular mothers, and costs associated with caregiving a child with a disability can be significant. Did, did you factor this into your study? Mm -hmm. We are. We were only able to look at. Um, what was available to us. This was already, this was data that was collected in 1994. So you have to keep in mind that we were working with a data set that we, we couldn't design. We had to look into that, into that big data set to say what could we use from this. In our study, um, in the clinical study where, we're, where we had control over the design, absolutely. We we're looking at the, uh, not only the kinds of um, uh, sources of income and support uh, that parents have access to, but also what kinds of liabilities do they have in their life? What kinds of what kind of assets and liabilities are they carrying? And these are not easy questions and uh, easy answers to get in the in the form of a survey because parents are often not that uh, forthcoming about their income and their assets and their liabilities. But we need to under in order to understand that relationship between social disadvantage or socioeconomic disadvantage and the health of children, um, we need to be able to document how the financial situation, broadly speaking, of families um, impacts uh, parents. Thank you for that question. And she also added, uh, she had a follow-up comment um, that she added where she says, I would also add to future research to consider the implications of the transition to adult services and the significant mm -hmm. impact on families. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter, you want to take that one on? Uh, well, I mean, it's a huge, huge issue which we, um, you know, haven't, haven't explored yet, but I, there's no question that I, among the issues with respect to transition to adulthood is that when the kids are 18, the parents are 18 years older than when they started. Um, so parents are at a different phase of their lives in terms of their health and well-being, potentially how much money they have, but also how much uh, distress they might be experiencing as their, as their former children move out of the child uh, orbit. Uh, and transition to adulthood is an enormously complex and important issue that people are happily beginning to pay attention to. 
right. Well, that is uh, that's the last of our questions, and we, we have uh, used up all of the time that we had scheduled. I've got actually a little bit a little bit over time, four minutes past uh, twelve thirty here. So, I think we'll we'll may uh, since there's no other questions, we'll we'll wrap it up there, and we'll maybe hand it over to Lucy and Peter if you have any, or and Daphne if you have any closing comments before we sign off. I do have a pitch for the clinical study for those of you who are in the centers where we're um, where we are recruiting. Um, there's a uh, again we I, we can put this information up. Uh, there is a central 1-800 number that can be called that parents can call uh, to be part of the study. It's 1-877-492-7200. The person that they would speak to is Matt Millen. This is at the University of Calgary, but it's not, it's not a long distance number. In other words, there's no charges incurred to you. Um, that if you would like to participate in either the uh, survey and or the qualitative interviews, um, Matt can certainly get, uh, get the ball rolling uh, for those parents. Uh, but otherwise, thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the audience, and thanks for your excellent questions. And thank you to Cassie for making this opportunity available. It's, uh, it was really fun for us to kind of figure out what, what ideas we wanted to put across. And uh, it's very useful, even within the confines of, uh, of the size and nature of the audience, to get some feedback and to hopefully stimulate people. And we're all findable if you have questions that you want to bring forward to us so separately. We look forward to talking to you again. All right, and we'll certainly be sending all of the information that that link to the uh, to the spot on the Can Child site that uh, Lucy had mentioned earlier. That we can even include that telephone number she just gave. We'll be sending an email to all of the participants on this webinar. If you're watching as a group, it'll only go to the person who's sort of registered as the person who connected to the webinar. So we'll ask those folks to pass the information along on our behalf. And just another reminder that uh, we do have part two of the Parenting Matters uh, webinar series coming up on March 28th, and that's. Uh, David Nicholas and Ted McNeil um, talking about uh, uh, fathering and the couple's relationship in in in, uh, in uh, pediatric chronic health conditions and dis and disability, um, and they're going to be examining the the experience of experiences of fathers caring for children with a chronic health condition or a disability. So that's March 28th. The registration has just opened yesterday, and we'll we'll be uh, sending an email out tomorrow. But I'll include the link for registration on the email that we send with the, the information from this webinar to all the participants of, of this particular webinar. And also just to remind folks that all of this uh, will go up on the CAPC Knowledge Exchange Network, which is at www.can.capc.org. That's K-E-N dot C-A-P-H-C dot org. usually takes us about a week or so to get the information up there. But again, once you, uh, we'll send a link around when that is available, and we encourage you to pass uh, that, that link along to anyone you think would be interested in watching this content. So thanks again to, uh, to the audience, as well as to our, our presenters, uh, Peter, Lucy, and Daphna, and uh, Rubab in her, in her absence. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, again, CAPSI has been a part of this work as a, as a KT partner uh, in this, and we've been, it's been a great experience to be part of this, and we're happy to share this, uh, this information with our audience. So thanks again to our presenters and to the audience, and we look forward to seeing everyone uh, back on March 28th.